horror for blacks continues to be a study in racism, exoticism, and neocolonialism in which black Americans are portrayed as outside of Western images of enlightenment, while being subordinated to a system of primitive images, political, economic, cultural, religious, and social. Horror films come out of the imaginations of a diverse cadre of image makers. One thing that is clear is how difficult it is to create representations that break free from the steady diet of confining depictions image makers have already been fed. Horror continues to propagate an us, them, and us versus them understanding of race relationships in which cross-cultural communication is displayed as difficult to negotiate head on. As a result, horror is at times overly segregated or too much of just quote us. Non-black horror has been particularly difficult on this point, uncomfortably excluding blacks and all manner of gender, sexuality, and racial diversity. The response to such exclusion has been the production of still more quote us horror films. Quote, black horror, for example, was born in part out of exclusion. Horror has also taken up the tact of colorblind-ish casting, assembling a multicultural, quote, one of each crew of young horror victims. The Descent from 2005 and Dracula 2000 from 2000 asked audiences to see but not make a big deal of race or racial cultural investments. Such erasure in it is an unsatisfying approach as well, at least for those who do not view identity and cultural invisibility as a viable solution to inclusiveness. Still, the cultural narrative on race swirls around the unsustainability of race and the quote post-racial. Declarations of race ends here are bolstered by claims of internal sameness, superficial external differences, and the cumbersome work of trying to maintain what Lewis calls a raciology in a world that also embraces anti-racism. However, black horror and colorblind horror do not represent a stalemate. It is worth giving continued careful consideration to privileged racial identities and racial coded cultural practices, styles, and aesthetics while dismantling racial hierarchies. Importantly, racially coded productions can serve a target audience while not precluding other audiences sharing in the experience. Dr. Robin R. Means Coleman from her 2011 book Horror Noir, Blacks in American Horror Films from the 1890s to Present. film podcast where we explore new perspectives on black genre cinema and discuss alternative narratives in genre film through a black lens. My name is Graham Cumberbatch and this is episode 8. This is also the talk back for week 8 and the finale of our two-month virtual film series hosted by Hyperreal Film Club out of Austin, Texas. All August we've invited viewers and listeners to watch along with us as we've focused on a different black film and a different genre of cinema each week and discuss the film's and maker's contributions to the forum. At the end of each week, we've aired a new episode of the Black is Not a Genre podcast featuring an evolving lineup of special guests. Moving forward, we'll be hosting these talkbacks as a standalone podcast, continuing to explore a myriad of films, themes, and players within the Black genre film universe. This week, we'll be discussing horror with another seminal double feature, Bill Gunn's 1973 art house existential vampire manifesto, Ganja and Hess, and Ernest Dickerson's 1990 black succubus indie flick, Death by Temptation. Before I introduce this week's guests, I want to give a special thank you to Hyperreal Film Club for hosting us as part of their summer programming. In addition to presenting an eclectic mix of the world's greatest movies, Hyperreal Film Club seeks to build a special community around the moving image. They specialize in creating unique movie-watching experiences in unusual, thoughtful, and immersive pop-up environments. Hyperreal also amplify local artists by screening the pieces they've already produced, as well as creating paid opportunities for them to create and exhibit new work. They're always looking for collaborators, so whether you have a short film or music video you'd like to premiere, or you're just looking to connect with other local filmmakers, hit them up. This week we are joined by a trio of amazing guests. Returning guest Gerald Hersey is an Austin-based designer, former film critic for the Tribune in Mesa, Arizona, and curator and founder of a local film club now in his fourth year of weekly program. We are also joined by a very special first-time guest, Kat and Jazz, co-host of Girl That's Scary a film podcast featuring reviews, commentary, and weekly content around all things horror. Two homegirls discussing poltergeists, their plans for the pending zombie apocalypse, and everything in between. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for tuning in. Welcome to Black is Not a Genre. This is episode eight, uh, and this week we'll be discussing horror. We have another double feature. We have a 1973 film, Ganja and Hess, by director Bill Gunn. 
And we have a 1990 film, Death by Temptation, by uh, director and cinematographer Ernest Dickerson. Uh, with us this week, we have returning guest, Gerald Hersey, who's a local designer and curator of a local film club. Thanks for coming, Gerald. Yeah, good to be back. And special, special new guests, we have Kat and Jazz from Girl That's Scary, a pot film podcast specializing in all things horror and all the various subgenres. Uh, thank you for joining us, Kat and Jazz. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Of course, I'm very excited. Um, I guess, well, just first things first, just to, just to do, do a temperature check. Um, since we are a film podcast and a Black film podcast, uh, I remiss if we didn't, uh, if we didn't mention that we did lose someone yesterday as of the recording of this podcast. Uh, we're recording on Saturday the 29th, Friday the 28th. We all kind of found out at the same time that Chadwick Boseman, not only had he passed away, but he had been struggling with cancer for a few years and hadn't really told anyone outside of his, uh, his, his inner circle. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, do a quick check-in and see how everyone's feeling about that because it, it did, I think it hit a lot of us pretty hard. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was a dream, but it, if it was a dream, it'd still be a damn nightmare. So Absolutely. here we are again. And then, you know, I'm just trying, I, the God is still working on me because I, <laughs> I'm like, you know, other people were right there and you just took, you took Black Panther. Like I went to see that twice and I don't even go to the movies like that. I, I dressed up, I wore Dashiki. Same, I did. same. I was so Y'all excited. So I'm a nerd. Yeah, I, I remember taking my kids to see it. Um, I mean, at the time, like there, there wasn't a movie anything like it, you know, like, like, look, like, like not just a black superhero, but like this entire world full of beautiful black people, and 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 they're the smartest and the richest and and, and the most technologically advanced. I mean, like that was that was a moment for me. So yeah, um, and also baseball is celebrating Jackie Robinson Day, I and know. Jackie Robinson too. So it was like, come on, <laughs> like, it was almost too much. It is. That There's is. way too much going on right now, just in general. It's just way too much. Yeah, yeah it. I. It's weird because it's like, you know, it's kind of cheap. I. I. I am someone. Obviously, it's kind of what, why I do what I do. I get very deeply invested in films, and you just see all these sort of like flashes of, you know, my mind immediately went to, um, what's the one before Endgame? I forgot the one. Infinity War. Infinity, Infinity War. War, where he disappears, and I was I was devastated in the theater. I like I actually literally couldn't handle it. And my like you said, dressing up. My sister had her, I don't, I don't remember which birthday it was, but she she decided to. Uh, it came out around that time, so she she rented out one of the little theaters at the local draft house, and we all dressed up and went, and it was so fun. Like, and it, you just you know we live in Austin. It's not. It's not known for being the most diverse, and we have definitely issues with black retention here. Um, so it was one of those moments where you know it's we just all kind of took over the theater, and it was really exciting and and really memorable. And I think I, I think for a while, Chadwick in particular, I I really do think I took him for granted. Not just how talented he was, but also, I think for a while it was just kind of like a little bit of a running joke, where it's like, oh, he's just going to play every famous black person. Um, and it was what James Brown, Jackie Robinson, Thurgood Marshall, and we we're like, all right, all right, because because you know we're always taught to think about in Hollywood like oversaturation or whatever, but now it it just makes sense. It's just like he had a lot to do because he wasn't he wasn't here that much longer. So I, you know, rest in peace for sure. Yeah, and just shout out to the people who deal with chronic illnesses on mm -hmm. a daily basis. Because like they said, the you time because I have a friend like that, and they view time very different. So that's why we was like, "What are you doing all this?" And he's like, "No, I have this amount of time. Yep. I got to do all this right here." So Absolutely. I'm like, they just have a different concept of it. So it's like, wow, look at these great things that you did, and look how you dedicated your image because you didn't have to do that. You were sick. Right. You dedicated your image to uh, like the kids, mm -hmm. like because I I I'm an educator. I teach you know middle school kids and Wakanda every day. Okay. Let me tell you, yeah, so all day. And I was turned with them. <laughs> exactly. No, I'd love that there's, you could see the outpouring. It was so intergenerational, which is actually kind of, uh, it's tricky with the black community because there, there does tend to be gaps sometimes, but Black Panther was something that, you know, stretched for all of us. Cause it's like people as old as my parents and grandparents have been waiting. My dad was in the comic books. We were waiting for a black superhero for a really long time. Um, and it, so it, it, it made a really big impact. And like you said, like, 
you know, actors don't have to be role models. And he decided to, which is a big deal. And it's a lot of pressure, especially when you're really tired. I just can't imagine him being like being that exhausted all the time. But um, yeah, it made a really big impact. And it makes a difference because the film was good. You know, it's one thing if it's slightly disappointing, it's another thing if it exceeds all your expectations. So <laughs> I think it was the, at the time before all the new blockbusters came, I think it was the third highest grossing American film. Like, that's so, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that movie, it kicks some serious ass. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not a great segue from that, but um, I think <laughs> it's one of the things that we kind of deal, deal with, I think one of the weird kind of eerie recurring themes with this film series, we end up running into a lot of really prolific um, and talented sort of black directors and actresses who passed away like early middle age. So the director of Ganja and Hess, Bill Gunn, I think he passed away from cancer at, at 50, what, I just looked it up, 54. Um, Dwayne Jones, the, the actor from Night of the Living Dead, the actor from Ganja and Hess, he died at uh, 51. Uh, Kathleen Collins, the director of the film that we watched last week, which featured Bill Gunn, um, Losing Ground, she died in her early 40s, actually might even be 38 of cancer. I mean, of course, there's, you know, there's, there's the Charlie Murphys, there's the Bernie Macs. So this is something that affects the Black community, the Black film community pretty hard because there aren't that many of us. Um, and, you know, there are all kinds of studies you can do on the stress of being Black in America and how it shortens your lifespan. So there's, there's a lot there. And, um, and it's, it's an interesting sort of, um, it's interesting that we're discussing horror because it's, you know, the, I, it's horror is one of the genres where it, it kind of starts at the end and works backwards sometimes where it's always the ultimate co like exploration of death. So there's, there's a lot there. Um, what, uh, let's start just kind of like with basic um, thing because one thing that I have to admit and which is I, I really wanted to, when I thought about doing this series, I had to include horror because I think it's just, it's one of the most important and metaphorical genres in film. It just communicates so much about society, about um, you know, what we fear, what we care about. Um, but I'm a wimp. Like I really cannot watch horror. <laughs> like I like, and I talked to this about Gerald too, is like, I don't do jump scares. I can only handle so much gore, but they're, so I, <laughs> I was pretty selfish when I selected these first films. Because one, I know one thing I do like is vampires. I'm cool with that. Um, vampires and zombies, I'm cool with. Um, and then two, I love Ernest Dickerson and, and, I, and sort of, I like the sort of uh, the camp sort of horror too. And so I definitely picked two films, not only that I thought were pretty seminal, but that I could handle. Um, so I guess just sort of a basic underlying notion, like what does what defines the, the genre of horror for you guys? Like what are, what are kind of the, the core elements that are, that are necessary? For, for horror in general? Yeah, for a good okay. horror film. Well, okay, so here's the thing. With horror, and I like the way Rotten Tomatoes and the stars work, I don't like that. Like it's like, ooh, three star. you don't really, there are different, there's an audience. Some mm -hmm. movies are marketed towards different audiences. So there's good slashers. Right. There's good psychological horror. There is good monster horror. There's good like, you know, different kinds. So it's not like, oh, these elements make the perfect horror movie. Mm -hmm. It's really about telling a good story yeah. Mm -hmm. hiring actual talent who knows how to convey the emotions of the characters if that's the target because some video some movies are not about good acting right. like trauma films or things like that and death by temptation is a trauma film it is it that's is mm -hmm. kind of campy and silly because mm -hmm. in some point because that's what they do that's what they specialize in and there's a market for that i don't think it makes it a bad movie because the actors aren't you know top notch i think that the in a different lane where scoring the scoring card is different for movies like that mm -hmm. so it depends on what your audience is but if you have either a good story mm -hmm. you know great acting or entertainment because movies at the end of the day don't have to tell a double story they're here to entertain so i don't want to you know separate that from the rest of movies because people want especially with black films they want black films to be deep and to mean things <laughs> and to tell these stories of <laughs> black trauma over and over again over and, and over i'm like again. i just want to see a black you know spaceship captain doing spaceship things i don't need to see right. like i don't need to see someone who was a slave and then i don't need all that <laughs> yeah. all the time. i live black trauma okay of course <laughs> but there's different yeah. elements it has to it has to do what it set out to do so all movies have like a goal and i'm like if you set out that goal and you execute that goal well that's what makes it a good movie 
No, I think that's a great, that's a great point. And I, I think, um, you know, like you said, audience is important. And also the last part of what you said too, is it, it has to fulfill the goal that it sets out. So you have to, like horror is one of those genres where you have to accept it on its own terms. You can't, you can't project your own ideas of what it should be. You're just like, okay, what is it? What is it trying to tell me? And then does it succeed? And that's, I think that's a perfect way to brew like all kinds of genre films. Um, and in regard to, to black, you know, there's a lot, there's a long history of, of what feels like um, sort of white filmmakers justifying the presence of black actors. So it's like, like you said, it's like, oh, they're here. So we have to work in some, some connection to slave. They can't just be here because this person drives a truck and, and that's why, and we need a truck driver. Um, and so there's, and there's a long history of like, um, you know, I think in the, in the 90s, there were a couple of films that were, that were really particularly known for. It was like, what was it, one was called Angel, Angel something, Angel Eyes. And another one was like the, the something in the serpent. The serpent in the, the rainbow. The serpent in the rainbow, that's right, that's this right. Film that was yeah, good. and I heard it was really good, but there were some, there were some black film critics who, were, who thought it, that it, uh, it was another, it was, one of the another tropes where it's like the only black characters is like surprise like voodoo or magical magical yeah, it's like, like the trade on the, the evil magical negro or even in the shining it's like this idea and they talk about this in this in the there's a book and a documentary on shutter which i, I need to get to watch called horror noir um have you watched it yes okay. we had a whole like episode that was with black horror films in general for mm -hmm. like black history month but um horror noir is worth the watch more than once to be yeah. quite honest yeah so whenever you get the time <laughs> they also no, have, I, go ahead, go ahead. they have like yeah. a, a podcast situation that you could follow along with as well which they have a lot more like interviews and more information that dives deeper into uh the documentary itself so that is also worth checking out excellent yeah i that was loosely part of my homework and i, I failed on that part but uh, yeah, Gerald, what were you, uh, you going to say? Oh, yeah, I was going to say, I think for me, because um, I'm in a similar boat where, where horror isn't my necessarily my go-to genre, cause, mm -hmm. but I do like a good jump scare. Um, we got we got screamed at in the movie It, because uh, I have this tendency to laugh after being scared, uh, and we laughed yeah. a lot during that movie. <laughs> and some lady chased us down, and it's like, you guys ruined the movie for us, so of course we just laughed in response. Oh, wow. um, but yeah, I, I think one of the cool things about... Uh, about horror is that they, they tend to work in the social commentary, you know, like I, I think that there's a couple of ways to get a good, a good social message across. It's usually with, it's either with comedy or with horror. Like, I think like those two genres really excel at that. And uh, so like when you can sneak in, um, like thinking of like Night of the Living Dead or, or, or even the, some of the things that are in Death by Temptation as well, just like how you can sneak in this, this commentary about what's happening at the time while still just telling a good, a good scary story, like, you know, uh, you know, if if you look at the zombies in Night of the Living Dead, if you if you imagine them just being all Trumpsters, being like show us show us your birth certificate, you know, like <laughs> you could you can totally you can totally transform you can totally transform your view into that movie. But um, but what, but thinking of Death by Temptation, I just thought about the AIDS epidemic the whole time. Yeah. Um, just thinking back to that time and, and the people that we were losing in my family and, and and my mom's friends who were losing to that disease and and just kind of thinking of this horror film where it's like there's this succubus who's like if you get if you get lured in you know, uh, you might get trapped. So just like the, 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 the social commentary is a, is a nice part of it too. Like in addition to jump scaring me. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that attracts me to the genre as well is that it's, it's almost like inherently metaphorical. Um, and it, and it, it does, and it has a particular impact when we talk about black storytelling. I think one of the editors, um, Tanana Rive Du of, um, of Horror Noir, she's the one who wrote the original book and then, uh, or sorry, she was involved with the original book, but she was, she's a producer for the, for the documentary. She talks about how, um, you know, we're always talking about just like ideas of trauma and, and she's, you know, one of, one of her lines is always that like black history is horror. Um, and mm -hmm. so there's this, and you know, when, um, it was kind of a tongue in cheek comment, but when Jordan Peele, came out with get out he's like get out as a documentary <laughs> and so like there's this this concept where there's so many built-in metaphors because uh you know film sort of subconsciously 
dictates who we uh, who we're afraid of, who's included, who's excluded. Um, and there's a um, there's a lot there's a there is a, a black philosopher uh, Orlando Patterson who talks about this concept of like social death. Um, and so it's and it comes kind of from slavery years. And so you know the, I mean, yeah. So I, I sent it. I don't know if you guys did take a peek, but it's yeah, it's it's. One. It's a cool concept. I think it's it's a it's really important in terms of you know, it it comes from the history the history and sort of the defining characteristics of slavery, where you were you were stripped of everything, your name, your ability to pass it on, all your community relations, uh, none of your marriages were legal, um, and you're forced to. They didn't kill you, but you you're also not fully a person. So there's this limbo space uh, between uh, dead and. Uh, dead and alive and it's you know it's a perfect metaphor for a zombie uh, that can apply to vampires too um, and I think there's a lot uh, with Ganja and Hess I think there's there's a lot of uh, historical references going there so um, had y'all wait first of all had y'all seen had everyone seen Ganja and Hess before yes that's my yeah. second I watched movie. it I watched it like two weeks ago because I'm okay. working on a vampire thing so nice. we've just been churning through vampire things. So I was like, oh, black vampire movie. Uh oh. <laughs> say, no, uh -oh. say no more. <laughs> no, it's worth it. And I, I, this is my first time. I, it's one of those things that I'd known about for a long time. Um, but for a while, it was honestly hard to, hard to find. Um, it was, you know, he made it in 1973. He got some money from some producers. And this was on the tail end of black exploitation horror. So it was black, black you had come out. And so, they were, I think the people who gave it, fronted him the money were expecting something like Black Yella and got this total art house essay. Mm -hmm. And they were not happy. They basically buried the film. And I, I think it, it premiered at Cannes, did really well at Cannes, but no one really picked it up as far as distribution until much. And I don't even think it got, I think they had to recover it. It was pretty much buried by the time he died. Um, yeah, this, so this, this version was recut several times and re-released under different different titles. I was trying to find the list of all the different titles it was it was released under. Um, like people tried to kind of morph it into a uh, you know some sort of black exploitation type type film where the like you know like the in the in the titles I just I got to find the titles so keep going but like I got to find all the different titles it was under. Yeah, it's um, of course because we did Grindhouse not too far too long ago, a few mm -hmm. weeks ago, and Grindhouse is all the exploitation movies, and of course, black exploitation is a part of that, and yeah, you have Blackula, Abby, Blackula, Green Screen, Blackula, Scream, like you have all these movies. Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill, I love Sugar Hill, mm -hmm. all the time. You put all these movies in here, and they give you the, oh, we're gonna kick ass, black people talk like this, look like this, and they, yeah, it's kind of cool, but at the same time, they gave you something that was smart, and they weren't ready for that. Yeah. They weren't, they didn't like that, oh, because it's, it is an art house film. Like there's some things that don't make sense, but they make sense because they're metaphorical. They're not like on the nose. It's not like, oh, what you doing, Jack? And I'm gonna pull out this automatic gun and shoot. Yeah, I've seen Dolomite and shit. Like I do like those films. Like I like a wider range of things, but I also feel like it's okay to consume art about black people that makes you think and that you don't get right away. You should be able to, like we do that with other films and they win Oscars. You get to watch them two, three times. But when it's with us, it's like, mm -mm, we don't want that. We're gonna put that away. Yeah. Because I didn't find out about Gancha and Hess until like last year. And that's a movie from the 70s. That's crazy. <laughs> I didn't find out about Ganja and Hess until actually I saw the Horror in the War documentary. Um, and I, like, you know, it, it just, it was, it was new. And I was like, okay, well, let me go ahead and check this out. Because yes. I've seen a lot of black exploitation films, mostly due to my parents. My dad is like really big into like older movies. Mm -hmm. older, and this is their time. Like I have yeah. older parents. Um, so that was a thing watching old, you know, I know he's in the jail now, but Bill, Bill Cosby, all those movies back in the back, back, that was his thing. Um, so it was a really nice thing to have a new, new old movie yeah. recommended. And it was a good watch. And the thing about it, which is so strange that Dwayne Jones in Night of the Living Dead, one of the most popular horror films, like of all time. Mm -hmm. And you can't find it even about the nineties. I feel like it early nineties, they should have spread out. Like, cause it's still excuse me, my language. It's Dwayne Jones. Okay. I'm trying to be, you know, it's Dwayne Jones. Like, it's Dwayne Jones. Like, that's a star to us. So, yeah. There's Black Famous and not so Black Right, there's Black Famous. famous. But I mean, it, he's one of the rare stars that is, you know, he's Black Famous and he's maybe not mainstream Hollywood famous, but horror geeks, like, they 
he's he's in the pantheon so it it is confusing that it was that these and it, i think it shows a certain sorry my roommate is is drilling right now can y'all hear that it's it's, a, it's not okay um <laughs> but i think it it shows a lot of uh a lot of what people are have argued over the years about marketability is really just kind of making up excuses um, in a lot of ways, I think, because this really should have been a slam dunk. Even if you couldn't market it to a wide, as wide an audience as black exploitation, there's plenty of, there's a, there was plenty of market for, maybe not necessarily, and I, and I think part of what I will say is that Bill Gunn, as a filmmaker, as um, he was also an actor and a playwright, he in a lot of ways was ahead of his time. And I think um, art house horror, was on was not really necessarily a, a thing at the time it was on the cusp and there were still some there's still some horror films with art house elements um the, the italians were doing a lot of a lot of films that were that were overly um that were like saturated with color and like uh, say it again no it's, it's that the early 70s it was a golden era for for a lot of those giallo films yeah like, exactly just in my in all the vampire films i've been watching there's tons of tons of stuff from like the early 70s that's like really out there um with like where they're like sexual intrigue and just mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. just like really really high production value even though like they're low budget films um a, cu a couple of the a couple of the different names uh for for the re-releases were double possession and blood couple blood but like couple, again, I remember that. just kind of like just trying to chop the movie up i just wanted to finish that thought no i think that's exactly it because they definitely tried to repackage it um, to a specific audience, and it's because you know the black exploitation audience was a gold mine for them, and they they wanted to just keep raking it in. Um, but you went in a completely different direction. Um, the premise of the film obviously is uh, he's an and, and this is also the setting is another thing. Like you said, that threw it off is Bill Gunn, and Bill Gunn does this throughout his career where he he sets these sets up these black characters that are totally against type compared to what was on film so this guy he's a wealthy anthropologist this takes place in an environment where there's it's almost entirely black people but they're all upper middle class his um his son the what's the name hess's dr hess uh his son is studying away in france and and that's actually a funny reference because Dwayne jones himself studied at the sorbonne in france um and so that was and that, and then he went to new york city to study acting um, but anyway, so he is an, an anthropologist. We presume uh, his specialty is in, is in ancient African traditions. Um, he, um, he invites this professor to come, who's actually Bill Gunn, playing, the director playing that character. He invites this professor, uh, Maida, to come stay with him and be his assistant. Very quickly finds out that Maida is a bit unhinged. Um, he has suicidal thoughts, which is a big tip off. Um, God, I am so. Um, I, I mean, it's appropriate for horror, I guess. Um, but uh, then uh, things kind of go awry very quickly. He gets attacked, and essentially, what we think he's he's killed um, by anybody stabbed with an ancient dagger that that clearly uh, is endowed with some uh, some spirit, some special spirits. Um, Maida then commits suicide and Dwayne realizes that he's undead and he has a thirst for blood. Um, cut to a few weeks later after he's trying to, he's already figured out how to survive. He's robbing blood banks. Uh, the wife of this, of the assistant professor is back in town and calls him. Dwayne, does, uh, sorry, Hess doesn't want to divulge exactly what happened to the husband. So she comes and stays with him for a while. They fall in love and then eventually uh, he basically turns her, which is like a classic love story. After he, she finds out that uh, that her husband has been uh, in the dead in the cellar for a few months, um, and so they it, it turns into this sort of uh, vampire love story, um, which is a classic trope, but it has a it has a lot of uh, elements that those those stories don't typically have. Um, what so? What did you guys, uh, Gerald, Gerald? What did you think of the narrative having seen it not too long ago? Um, I, I, a little, I was a little confused at first, um, but as it, as it pulled me in, um, like after 
because I thought he was already the vampire, uh, but then he wasn't until the way they set it up. I was like, I didn't know if it was a flashback or if it was, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so I it was was a little tricky at the beginning, but like, but yeah, once I got into it, I I was there with it because it was just, yeah, it it was just this world that it's like, man, how how is he seeking out these victims? And you know, and and it's just kind of, um, it's just kind of slowly un you know, unveiling like what's happening, but the um. (laughs) <laughs> I, I think I might have mentioned this to you before, but like of, of all the of all the like kills and, and, and kind of like gory blood stuff in the movie, still the scene that grosses me out the most is when he brushes his teeth in the bathtub. Like that was just, <laughs> that was just too much. It's like, oh, he's brushing his teeth with his own bath. What? Oh, man, like that's that's too much. Um, but no, I, I, I really dug it. Um, I, I like that it that it introduced these characters who were, who were not typical of what you would get uh, in a film starring all, you know, starring all black folks. It's like they're, you know, it's, it's rich doctor. And, and then as soon as, as soon as Ganji comes in, she's just like a whirlwind. So like, I, I, I was just there with the characters the whole time. It was just like, I didn't know where it was going to take me, but I was, I was happy to go on the ride. Yeah. Um, I definitely love, well, first of all, this movie, I'm not into vampire stories that much. Mm-hmm. Kat's a bigger fan of vampire stories because I'm more into gore, um, slashers, very excited. And I also don't like love stories that much. I'm not into comedy, I mean, uh, romantic movies or rom-coms. So I'm like vampire, vampire stories always usually tie in with like romantic stories. Like it's easy to do that. Um, but it's interesting because like I said, you said he's educated, he's rich. You know, the guy tries to commit suicide. He's like talking him down and then you see the spout of like this perspective of look if you jump off this tree and there's rope and it's my tree you jump off here they gonna call the police and I ain't even do nothing like you're already seeing like small bits of it and then he's hiding them and the wife comes which is so interesting I love Gonda um mm-hmm. one she's just stunning she's stunning looking like yeah. this beautiful this beautiful black woman and she's not light-skinned she don't got all the, like she don't have like you know a lot of white features I don't I want like a black woman Mm -hmm. and she's like commanded like come get me come do this I'm gonna do this this is what I'm going to do like she sets her boundaries she stands her ground and she puts herself first and I'm sure in the 70s that's not something you see very Mm -hmm. often like yeah I'm gonna cook for you but also ganja comes first I'm gonna I'm always gonna provide for me so I'm like wow I really liked that narrative and if you get towards the end spoiler alert you know she makes it at the end she makes a choice that no I'm I'm in this life I'm gonna live this life now it's here, mm-hmm. you know, because, you know, Dr. Dr. Well, has green, but Dr. Hess decides, um, I'm going to go, you know, walk into the shadow of the cross, which he finds out is like his destruction, which also, because I feel like there's a parallel between, you know, black, um, black culture, like ancient black culture, or like tribal culture, mm-hmm. because every time the blood is involved, you hear that music and that sound in the background. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this is relating. And I feel like maybe he was like, no, I'm going to reject it. And then he went to the cross, which is to me is christianity seems very mm-hmm. white that's white like they, they made that they you know i'm not Absolutely. even gonna hold you and i grew up in a christian home uh, but you know he succumbed to that mm-hmm. and she's like no i'm gonna live on because at the end she's smiling yes mm-hmm. and she got a new man mm-hmm. she did yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's she. Okay. That's she got she. a new house and a new man younger uh, man yeah no, I think the when he exact- comes out the swimming pool, that that is that's, that's how you scene. end the movie right there. <laughs> like, oh, that is like that is hardcore. I I love the end of that movie, and I th- I think you you definitely hit the nail on the head. I think there's a there is definitely um, and you see this repeating a lot of and you, you know we'll talk about death by temptation because there's a lot of there's very strong religious overtones um, there too. But this conflict between um, these Af- West African West African um, indigenous religions and faith and Christianity. So there's this conflict between uh, colonialization and uh, sort of this African heritage that, that a lot of Black Americans have been separated from. Um, and, you know, there's a lot, you know, there's been, Ganjin has been described as a sort of an allegory for assimilation. Um, and there's a, he, the, the poem that, um, that Dr. Maida reads, which ended up being his suicide road. That was actually a poem that Bill Gunn wrote um, before the film, but he, he worked it in, in into the into the script. Um, and it, it's 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 a little bit hard to wrap your head, my head around a little bit, but it has a, it's it has some really interesting notes there. He talks about um, he says you are despised of the earth, 
that is as if you were water in the desert. To be adored on this planet is to be a symbol of success, and you must not succeed on any terms because life is endless. You are as nameless as a flower. You are the child of Venus, and her natural affection is lust. So you will touch her belly with the, her tongue, but you must not suffer in it, for love is all there is, and you are cannon fodder in his defense. Um, and he talks about in there how um, you know man's desire to learn is or the man's desire to teach is the enemy of, of, of learning. And so he has this embedded in there, particularly with the, the thoughts of like being a symbol of success. So he ha he's, he's kind of describing this trap that his character fills in and this trap that black people feel where it's they, in order to survive, they feel like they have to succeed under the terms of like, of, under colonial terms, exactly. Mm -hmm. So the capitalist terms or whatever, but that's, uh, he, and he has another line and says, um, he says, philosophy is a prison. It disregards the uncustomary things about you. The result of individual's visual thought is applicable only to itself. So, I mean, he talks about, there is this, this trap of assimilation, right? So it's like in order to survive, you have to succeed. In order to succeed, you have to adapt to this culture that wants to strip you of everything that makes you you, that makes you different. And so there's this constant struggle to succeed, but also not. And, and he has this, and I think that's, that's sort of the central conceit. And it's, it's interesting that it starts with Bill Gunn, as the character not being able to essentially live like that any longer. And then it, and then it passes on to, um, to Hess, who inadvertently receives this sort of like gift and a curse of eternal life um and he uh, and because he's someone who i guess you could argue has a, if not assimilated has at least carved himself out of life where he's comfortable in this in this white world um but he's but he's realizing once he gets this sort of like curse he realizes i think there's an element of of it being a much deeper struggle than maybe he thought and he's like actually i don't want to hang around forever doing this um, yeah. And I and it's and you kind of contrast that with with Ganja, who like she, as she lays out very like I think it's the scene after she finds out that her husband's been killed. Um, she lays out very. Uh, she tell it's a, I love I love Bill Gunn's photography. Like he, there are so many scenes where it's not that one character is talking to someone off screen. You don't see that person. Um, and I, I love this sort of way he frames that in this sort of isolation where they're. And they're almost everyone's almost talking to themselves in this sense. Um, and she has she lays out this thing about her family and how her mother never really said anything except that she was pretty. So she decided that she was going to be a survivor. And we see that she is she's adaptable. You know, the final the, the dude in the final scene is someone she killed, and she's like convinced that he's still alive when they bury her. Um, and then it turns out she is still alive. And so she has this you know while she agrees to to help. Uh, Hess and his his struggle, she's like actually I'm going to stick around and I'm going to adapt, which is a uh, which is not something you often see again from from black from black female characters. Um, how did how did y'all feel about the how did you feel about the style of the of the film? Was it something that you that you liked? Was it was it something you were used to or not? Or what what were you feeling? I thought it was beautiful, honestly. <laughs> like I'm usually into like movies. People are like oh it's so artsy fartsy mm -hmm. whatever. It was beautiful. Exactly, whatever. There were lots of shots. I think a shot that really just like rewatching it again that really sent me. Um, shortly after Ganja finds out that her husband is dead and it's the dinner scene, and then you have like Dr. Hess in the front and then the kind of like servant situation guy hanging out, and you see this long shot yes. of the actors throwing a tantrum. Like, this oh is God. great. This is great. That's such a good shot. That whole dinner scene is, it's incredible. They, they, when they, originally when she's talking, they frame her in between the candles and it's just, it's like on a tripod, nothing moves. And you're right, that, that scene where she go in the back, losing her shit <laughs> is incredible. I love it. It makes me feel like I'm at the dinner yeah. with them. Like I'm kind of just like here spectating and I'm watching everything that's happening down the hall and everybody's emotions is like, girl, let her go on, do what she doing. Yes. I also feel like because 70s films, I know you like 70s films. I like them too. But, you know, they have a, 70s films have like a certain, like a filter. Like it's, mm -hmm. it looks like a 70s film. And it just, Green, I don't yeah. know, I like the way those films look. I do. I like them. They, 
the just the lens they use and of course there's some frames like i feel like after um dr Hess, you know kills himself by sitting in the cross like the ambulance pulls up and you know ambulance is also a cross symbol too mm -hmm. and it pulls up and you see her face yeah, framed yeah, in the face cross face. like yeah. off to the side and then she stands beside it like uh, -uh. i'm not about to be in the shadow um <laughs> you can take him he is dead um yep let's call doctor five and <laughs> yeah please <laughs> yeah but you know you see that it's almost like she has a choice like am mm. i gonna because she could she could do it now and she yeah. asked her yeah and she said mm -hmm. no time to marry up mm -hmm. that's what no. i'm doing self-preservation nope i think one of the things that i uh, that i dug a lot was <clears throat> like whether well, it was you know a lot of the commentary about assimilation like there was also just a kind of a commentary about addiction as well because uh you see that uh you know we we see that a lot of a lot of folks who who did have a certain level of success like when we think about jazz musicians for for example a lot of them were had problems with heroin and things like this like we, we've we've lost a lot of folks to um you know to various types of, of drug addiction and so him being a, him being addicted to blood it's just like a lot of these scenarios just seem like like the like when he has when he goes to the bar and he meets the woman and then like the pimp tries to kill him you know it seems it seems like he's a pimp anyway uh but it's uh you know, he ends up in these situations that have this kind of intrigue and it's just kind of like why is this why is this doctor going out and getting into these situations which you would normally associate with somebody who's who's on drugs right it's like um i I remember a friend, this is a parallel story, but I think you get what I mean. It's like the, a friend of mine uh, lived in the same neighborhood as Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, who, who had a heroin addiction. Right. And, and he's, he was, he was telling a story shortly after he passed away. He was just like, yeah, I, I'd, I'd see him going to ATMs like in the middle of the night, you know, it's just kind of like, what, why are you going to an ATM in the middle of the night? You know what I mean? So it's just like little, little stuff like that, where it's just kind of like, yeah, after after a certain time, it's like you're you're probably getting into some stuff. And so there were there were these scenarios where you see where you see Hess's life and how how nice and, and opulent it is. But then a lot of these situations where he's going out to get these bites, it's uh you know it's like he's kind of like like he'll be wild. like when, like the woman with the babies, like he's like kind of watching her from afar, and it's just kind of like what's this about, you know? And then and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you see your you see your body a few minutes later. And so like it just seems like. There was a commentary about addiction too, just kind of like, hey, you you might be on one path, but but when it comes to getting the fix, you're you're gonna go wherever you need to go. No, I think that's a really good point, and it kind of, I mean, it kind of seeps into the you know certain concepts of like black upward mobility too, where there there are always these uh, there are always these these equalizers where it's like it it doesn't that's kind of part of the horror it's like it doesn't doesn't matter how hard you you've worked to sort of get into your own situation sort of out of out of these tra poverty traps there's still certain things that are that are lurking to kind of bring you to reel you back in and take you to places where you don't really need to be but you have to be um which i think is is a really interesting concept and i think the what is cool about the the visual style is you know the not only are the shots really beautifully framed but as you mentioned it's like they're they're all loaded there are no accidental shots there are no there are no sort of lingering looks that don't that don't carry a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of meaning um, and I I love the sort of the interaction between um, the and this is again another theme and we'll we'll shift to death by temptation in a second but the the sort of interaction between the urban environment where he where he kind of has to go to do his work or eventually to to cure his fix um and the sort of serene um rural space that he's carved out for himself not only in this sort of suburban sort of um escape intellectual escape but also the long the the field that's out there so these these lingering shots of the field that kind of double as this um kind of uh almost like a like a dual dimension right so there's like this there's a field that's that's outside his manor where they end up burying the bodies but it's also kind of the same field where he has this vision these visions of of these uh, ancient african rituals um that are that are actually kind of haunting him before he even gets stabbed so there's this sort of uh this sort of haunting of, of history where it's 
there's almost a, a weird, like a creepy inevitability. Like there's something, it's already been hunting him even before it started. Um, but I think the, one of the other things to go back to sort of the religious uh, overtones, um, there is, I mean, I guess, you know, Cat and Jazz, I think you guys probably run in, because I did, I listened to, what was one of the episodes of the podcast? I listened to the one, um, I don't know if it was the only one on possessions, but one of them was on demonic possessions. And obviously mm -hmm. that genre has a ton of, uh, it's almost entirely based on religious metaphors. Uh, what, do you, what do you guys think about when you, when you encounter these, uh, these sort of religious uh, themes? And do you think about them differently when it, when it comes to a black film like, like John T. Hess or Death by Temptation? Um, yes, because of course, religion is very different in the black community. Like a lot of us, you know, depending on your age, if you're older or younger, but definitely if you're older, like you went to church, that's yeah. what you did. Like, cause I remember when I was a kid, I, I went to church. Like I had to go, I had a kitty Bible. Everything is a Jesus. Ain't no therapy is Jesus. Everything is Jesus. Everything's the blood of God, which you hear a lot between both of these films like the blood of god no temptation it's just preachers like god is everything and if you just follow god everything will be mm -hmm. okay and i do like when sometimes black when black art challenges that yeah you know it's like no everything may be okay or might not be okay there's a double-edged sword like yeah he went to the lap of jesus but see but he also had to end his life to do that like he it's not like oh you get to you know hang out with god like no there are some darker sides to some of this um, cause I feel like in other films, it's usually just, if there's a demon, you use God to defeat the demon. Yeah. That is it. <laughs> you know, for the most part, yeah. God is the weapon of the righteous or the weapon of the hero or protagonist versus it could be, you don't know. It's not, it's kind of ambiguous, which one is right or wrong. You know, I liked, I like that exploration cause I feel like that hasn't been explored enough. Mm -hmm. I like, I, I like a little challenge, but people you're real touchy when you talk about religion. So I feel like that's one of the reasons why, especially in the 70s and things like that, when they had Grindhouse films, because they were not having it. They will protest your film. They will get you buried. They will get you blocked. They will ban your book. They will do whatever they have to do mm -hmm. to keep you from talking about their Jesus. And I'm like, but you could just open. You don't have to stop believing. You could just, okay. <laughs> yeah, you just open <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, the, um, I think one of the, one of the funny things about, like, I same thing, you know, you grew up in, most black families it's like the church is almost like a community center it's like the center of you know a lot of the times it, it'll be the place where you actually meet the other black people who live in uh who live in your community especially if you live out west where it's like a bit more like a bit more homogenous and and so it's it's funny like you know you it's it's one thing when you just read when you just read the jesus parts of the bible but some of those some of those other books got some weird stuff <laughs> you know so it's just kind of I, I like it when they explore this stuff you know and when they got demons or they're talking about you know you know prophecies and you know and, and it's like in, in, in exorcisms and things like this it's like yeah this stuff is scary like this, this this is good fodder for for a scary movie you know it doesn't necessarily have to be canonical it's just like give me something that's interesting you know uh i mean uh the more the more stuff that i've read from other cultures too it's just like you just see like these are just there's just some good stories there's just some good stories here like this is this is ripe for for adaptation and exploration no, I don't, I don't. I don't really believe in sacred cows. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like I don't think anything's off limits. It's just kind of like, you know, if 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 it stands up to scrutiny, okay. But it also can. It can also just be fun. You know, it's like we can yeah. we can acknowledge that that demons coming after you is scary. Even even if even if you do got to play the Jesus card at the end to win out, it's just like you can still scare. You still show us how scary it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the sort of again. There's like this culture, the religious mm -hmm. culture class. Um, so that you know, sort of dueling philosophies, there's, you know, different religious cultures have different ideas of what it, of what the blood symbolizes. They have different mm -hmm. concepts of like the dead and the undead, you know, biblically, like, you know, you could argue Lazarus is a great metaphor for vampires um, in terms of reviving from the dead. And then you have these, uh, you know, you have these concepts of uh, the sort of the sanctity and the salvation of the blood of Jesus, but also this uh he's kind of hammering on this concept of you know digesting the blood or being covered in the blood is meant to be 
um, to be to be as an uh, um, what am I trying to say? It meant to be a gateway to salvation, but it's also, but the way in which Christianity has been uh, implemented and enforced on Black people and, and slave derived Black people uh, has been a curse. It's been, it's been an, as a, in a way to sort of damn them to this sort of eternal hell, to sort of project society's evil onto them. Um, and so he's, he's kind of dueling, he's talking about these sort of dueling uh, religious concepts. Um, and in the end, there's this, like you said, that there is this release in religion, but it requires like an ultimate sacrifice. Um, and so there's this, there's a, there is a, um, there's a lot there in terms of um, conflicting ideas um, and different ideas of, of what really freedom means. It's like freedom, there's a concept of freedom within religion and freedom from religion. And there's, there's, the black community is something uh, is a is a community that kind of deals with that on a on a daily basis. Um, I wanted to talk. I guess that's a pretty good segue into Death by Temptation, which is another one of my films uh, favorite horror films. I have a very short list of favorite films uh, horror films because there are only so many I can watch. But uh, so Death by Temptation came out in 1990. Uh, it's directed by Ernest Dickerson who is kind of an unheralded uh, horror pioneer. Uh, I think he did, it, he did a couple other uh, horror films. He did one of the Tales from the Hood spinoffs. I, uh, I forget what it's called. Um, so, but this was in, and he, he made his name being this, collaborating with Spike Lee. He was a cinematographer for, um, for most of Spike Lee's early films, like Do the Right Thing, uh, School Days. Um, and then he, his first, the first one he directed on his own was Juice, which is another classic. Um, and then this film came out um, kind of on, so the 70s, of course, was like this whole, a whole wave of horror film um, kind of fused with black exploitation. Um, and then, and then it was also a, an initial wave of black experimental film, um, a lot of the initial like black art tours that, that kind of got their start. And then the 90s kind of became another wave. So it was on the tail end of the Spike Lee's and, the, um, and then it would blend into like the John Singleton. So this, it's on the cusp of this black new wave. Um, so Death by Temptation, if you kind of see by the name was, again, was dealing with different marketing issues. It's like they wanted to kind of make it Market is sort of like a black, uh, like hood horror film, but also you know Ernest Dickerson is never he never he never oversimplifies. Like he always has an angle. You know, Juice was um, was kind of lumped in uh, later on with a lot of the like hood uh, sort of like CNN of the hood movies, but it's really just a classic sort of film noir that he that he that he crafted. And so this one is uh, like a a black morality tale. Um, and it's, it stars James Bond III, uh, who also wrote it, and Kadeem Hardison, uh, Samuel Jackson has, a, has, a, has an appearance. We just watched, last week's theme for the show was uh, musicals, and we watched School Days, so, yes. which is another great classic on Netflix now. Um, and James Bond III and Kadeem Hardison are both in School Days. Um, and obviously, Kadeem Hardison went on to do a different world and everything. Um, but they're they're both excellent in this movie. I love Kadeem Hardison. I still think he's so underrated. I think he's a brilliant actor. He's great in everything. Um, and James Bond the Third. I think it took me a while to get used to his his acting style. But he plays a really interesting sort of soft spoken sort of church boy um, thing. And so one of the things that they add into the mix of this religious thing is this sort of um, it kind of references black migration, right? So a lot of a lot of the black people that we know live up. Uh, like in the DMV area and in New York, um, their families got there because they migrated from the Deep South. And so there's this dichotomy between uh, Kadeem Hardison's character, who studied the ministry with, uh, with James Bond III, um, but then he's, it's his cousin, I, I think, and, but then left to seek you know, fame and fortune in the big city, he becomes like a, a pretty decent like B action movie actor, um, while his, his cousin, follows in his father's, who's played by Samuel Jackson in several flashbacks, follows in his footsteps to, be, to follow the ministry. Um, so there's this dichotomy between the sort of the Southern uh, uh, church 
going man who's who stays in line with his his morals and the the sort of prodigal son figure who goes to the big city and is faced with temptation and perhaps has corrupted his soul and so James Bond the third's character goes up to New York to visit his cousin um, and he kind of steps into something that he's not expecting so there's this succubus on the loose um, who's played by um, uh, what's her last her first her last name is Bond I'm trying to remember her first name but she's actually Cynthia Bond Cynthia Bond who is actually apparently uh, Julian Bond's cousin the civil rights activist but she it was she's an author but this is actually the only film she ever did which is kind of incredible because I think she's really good in it um, she plays it she plays it really straightforward and like like uh, jazz like you were saying there is um, there's a certain kind of performance that you have to give in certain horror films that you wouldn't necessarily give in other genres where it's, you know, in other genres, they might seem over the top, but in, in horror, it's like, you have to, you have to get the audience to buy in. That means you have to buy in. So it makes it, it makes it kind of tricky. And I think she really um, nails it. Uh, have you, had y'all seen, y'all seen it before, right? Yeah. Okay. What did, what did y'all think about it this, this time around? What, what things stuck out to you? Okay, so the first time I saw it, I did not like it because mm -hmm. I missed the part where it said it's a trauma film. So yeah. I was looking at it with like a serious lens and I was like, this movie's stupid. I don't understand. <laughs> and I watched it again like last night and I was like, oh, this is a trauma. Duh. Yeah. I, I was looking at it the wrong way. Uh -huh. I was looking at it as a different from a different audience standpoint. And I was like, oh no, this is supposed to be over the top. This is supposed to be a little silly. It's also gonna give you some some gruesome things because there's some there's blood. Not that much, you know, a small amount. But you know, I was like, okay, this is the performance that fits this movie now. Cause I was like, oh, okay. Cause I don't know if you've seen like Trauma's War or The Toxic Avenger, those Yeah, ridiculous. exactly. So I'm like, all right, and it wasn't even that ridiculous. It's the most calm, like tame. It's so chill. It's <laughs> I've seen. I was like, okay, this is over the top, but it's actually not that mm -hmm. over to, over the top. That's why it was so easy for me to go, oh, this movie is stupid when looking at it through a serious film because it wasn't obvious mm -hmm. from the beginning. I wasn't like, oh, this is gonna be one of those kind of films. Like I was like, oh no, this is a regular, you know, black film. They in a the bar, they, you know. They do <laughs> Okay, that's cool. I was like, oh no, let me look at it the other way. First of all, there's looks. I love the black Come aesthetic. On. I love the black aesthetic. I love her nail, her nails. Um, <laughs> that was the first thing I noticed. Serious club. I was like, yes. I was like, oh look, yes, give me auntie vibes because I'm an auntie. And I was like, okay, you got this look. You're like, let me do this. Like this woman is on the prowl. So it's first like, oh, let me buy you a drink. Let me do this. And then she pulls up, and then she kind of, well, she, I don't know, if she eats them, but she definitely kills them. Mm -hmm. She definitely mm -hmm. kills him. And kind of, you know, reverses the role of I'm the predator because I'm the, I'm going to use my seduction as a weapon to I you. I love it. And it's going to be easy because men fall into seduction. Of, I mean, you know, not in that, in that all the men she encounters, except for like one or two, were like, yes, eating out the palm of her hand. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. she was feeding them was poison because... <laughs> Ooh, she was taking them out left and right. I don't understand how the police did not even show up. <laughs> I love it's like I guess the police don't show up in the hood, so it's like whatever. It's just right. quiet bar. Yeah, you you might hear some sirens, but they ain't coming for you. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's something. I, I, there had been a big gap in between seeing this one. Um, I remember that this was one of the uh, this was one of the kind of first indie films that I remember hearing my hearing my mom and my uncles talk about. Um, just being like, oh, have you guys seen? Like, it was like this, you know, you know, you're at the at the family, you know, gathering or whatever, and it's like, have you seen Death by Temptation? You got to watch it. It's this, it's this movie. With it. Like, they were just excited that there was this black horror film that was like kind of, you know, under the radar. So uh, I remember we had, we probably had a a bootleg, of it, but like I remember watching it. Like I was, I was probably in like eighth grade when I watched it the first time, and then, but it was just, it was. I mean, I, I think I knew Kadeem Hardison from a different world at that time, but it was just kind of like, okay, like I, I hadn't seen, I had, usually I had seen horror movies where there's one black person and they usually die in the first half hour. But this was like, you know, the, the entire cast was black. And then I had recognized a lot of folks from, from other Spike, from other Spike, Spike Lee projects. So, um, so it was, it was funny to watch it again. Also, knowing that it was a trauma film and just being like, okay, like this is, this is supposed to be a, a bit over the top. But I think that some of the stuff that stood out to me was just like, 
this is a pre- they they did a lot with a small budget. Um, like they like I remember like the first scene where she kills uh where she kills uh, I just want to call him Greer, um, uh the the dude who's in uh, that she's got to have John, it. John uh, Canada Terrell. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, I had to write his name down because I always I always forget like the full name. But yeah, um, like the the whole setup for his death at the beginning of the movie is so good. Like where he's on the phone just dogging this girl out, like she's like clearly pregnant. He's like, oh, the, the check's in the mail. I'll, I'll pay for the abortion or whatever. And then she she lures him in immediately. And then you know, in the like this the scene like the the love scene in her bathroom where it's like it's the black tile and then like the like the the gorgeous black bodies and then like and then it starts like the blood starts coming out of out of the shower head and it's like I don't know how this logically makes him but it looks so good you know <laughs> so it's like I was like yeah this is I love the way that that it starts and just pulls you right into it it's just like no he in trouble <laughs> no I think you're right and again this is like two just really directors with really great eyes i mean we've seen ernest's work on spike lee and how beautiful he shoots those but this it's like again obviously probably a shoestring budget the lighting and everything is shot beautifully he just he kind of know there's it's almost like a play because it's very short it's kind of like a short film there's a small is a small set setup it's just the house the bar and then the other house and that's it um and the and the, he, he clearly does a lot with so little the the clim- the ultimate climactic scene um which is just a room with some sheets and some really cool lights and it looks gorgeous um i think there's a there's a lot there as far as um uh visuals and i i think um this i think it it's a it makes a big impact because it's uh like you said it's it's a tr- again he's like he's going against type so it's like not only this is a trauma film but it's also uncharacteristic for a trauma film and that it, it it deals with um it deals with some some issues that are while sort of you know overly simplified some of these issues within the black community it has a sort of uh sort of almost like mystical moral compass um to it uh you know the succubus and this i think what's interesting about the succubus too is like there are always every film sort of establishes rules um so you know like in a slasher, it's like if you're you can't really you can't survive unless you're a virgin. Or um, you know, the succubus, you know, she she kills people, but she can only kill because because she's the spirit of temptation. She can only kill people who, in a sense, have kind of earned it by by compromising their morals. So like the opening scene, uh, the guy he's obviously just a dog in general, um, and then the dude who's cheating on his wife. Um, and she, and in a sense, she, she the, wedding ring immediately. the wedding room. Yeah, exactly. And he, and she kind of decides the punishment, right? So she kills one guy who's just a dog, but the guy, the wedding ring, he lets him lit. She lets him live, but marks him with this, another stand in for an STD basically. So he's, he's ruined for life in that sense. Um, but I think there's a, it's one of the, it's one of those films that is really, it's almost like a quiet horror film. There's just like, it's just, there's not a lot to it. There's a very simple story, um, but there's a lot of uh, sort of heavy imagery um, involved. Mm-hmm. What, did, what did you guys think about some of the, some of the themes, uh, particularly with a lot of the, the religious flashbacks um, and references to him being like the last in line of the, of the preachers, basically, in his family? It's like he's the chosen one. And as, as you, of course, the grandma starts off, we always got a black praying grandma. Always. Always. But you know what? <laughs> but they're important. Thing. They're important. Because my grandma praying for me right now. I know she is. Um, so she's like, you know, right before you reach your goal, there's that's a crossroad. Mm-hmm. Like she's letting him know he going to New York. And I'm like, mm, he about to he about to see something that he ain't supposed to see or do something he ain't mm-hmm. supposed to do. And you know, he's all innocent. He's kind of sheltered. He's been living in the church life his whole life. He's probably never had no girlfriend. And you know, he's New not, York is the opposite. New York is wild. It's uh, it's wild, and um, he's up here with this woman who play knows how to tempt him by being innocent. Pretend she don't even know the cousin. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, and the cousin still like I think because I'm like if I'm remembering this correctly, I feel like the cousin still dies. Like she sucks him into the TV, doesn't she? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. like. She, mm-hmm. But he was gonna do that though. If she would have um, played with him, he definitely was going to you know, fall in love with her or date her, but she was like, you're an obstacle no. to me now. 
Because yeah. I'm trying to stop this person who's trying to be on their way to Jesus. And mm-hmm. Clearly, this one is about to be this prolific creature. Also, there's like flashes of his dad. I wonder if his dad had that same fate, like was tempted by something, and that's why he died, and that's, that's why that possible. car accident happened. And they kind of mm-hmm. allude to it, but not really sure. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely the imagery of if you don't make the right choice, these there's consequences. Mm-hmm. There's just always consequences for your choices because these people mm-hmm. choose to do these things because mm-hmm. she doesn't she doesn't push you and make you go she'll give you the address and be like you come to my house that's true and she they, know they gonna pull up and they pull up though they pull up she and then they do all the things they stay still like even with the married man she pulls a knife on him and it's rubbing his butt and i understand like there's a couple of stuff <laughs> knife play. yeah knife play with like bdsm mm-hmm. or something but he's not into that that looks like a married man his wife don't do none of that his wife probably washing dishes at home but he might be into something new tonight girl she pulls a knife on him and he still stays still he doesn't object he's like okay stay still even if he's a little scared and kind of knows it's wrong and he deserves his punishment for that um i also kind of like the comedy they threw in up i feel like that was a good you know you're getting this woman killing these people but then you get this man this fbi agent who ends up being like this fbi agent or something like that when you think he's just this guy striking out at the bar hot tell lying to these girls to talk to them all the time he's also what's his name his name he's dougie and play by yeah, Bill Nye. 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 Yeah. R.I.P. Yeah, do the right thing, New Jack City, Sister Act. You've you've seen yeah. him. He's black he's famous. Been you've seen him, mm-hmm. and he's you know he's funny because he's just telling the girls, "I'm a boxer. I'm a wrestler. I'm a do- I'm this. I'm a music producer." <laughs> he's like, I'm he's said, "I'm a kung fu surgeon." surgeon. <laughs> yes, anything. Yes. And that's a funny part. But then you realize, no, he's playing. He's watching that girl, mm-hmm. and there's she has bodies. I'm afraid of her. Let's go get her. And it, it's kind of wild that he's this agent of like okay i'm funny and comical but i know the truth then he turns out to be something like her at the end they surprise surprise i mean that's i feel like she did that because she definitely killed him he didn't do that on his own she she was yeah, like oh yeah. you're on my tail too you're dead. yeah well and then kadeem yeah, hardison like, yeah, she, ends up being the driver them, yeah. that's uh which isn't like a preview of uh of his role in uh vampire in brooklyn right yeah exactly like, isn't he eddie murphy's assistant you know which I, um, there's so much connection go ahead yeah, some of the um, some of the things that stuck out to me, um, just like just like some of the little details, like um, like you mentioned, like she doesn't she doesn't necessarily like overpower you. She just like tempts you because there's the there's the bisexual character um, who gets hit on in the bar first, and then and then you know he stands by her, and then she puts she puts her address into his pocket, and then she, when so during the scene where she ends up uh, killing him. Uh, like pegging him and then killing him like the that's being cut back and forth where he's uh where Kadeem Hardison is describing her like uh, just how like oh she's so sweet and like I feel like this is somebody I can fall in love with meanwhile she is just like being totally rude to this guy and (laughs) it's like you're not supposed to be here unless you're invited or you have an appointment and then like you know and and so he's describing her virtues meanwhile like she is just like just you know (laughs) just just setting this guy up to kill him and it's just like Oh, okay. Like there's, there's, there's another layer to this, you know, where it's just like, it's, it's not just, it's not just, you know, straight men that she's feasting on. It's anyone who can be tempted. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so if you're, so if you're at this point at this, at this, you know, crossroads to use the, the grandmother's metaphor, it's like this character might've been on the verge of fully coming out. Right. But it's just kind of like, oh, well, maybe, maybe I should give one, one, one more try. Right. Maybe, maybe there's, maybe there is something wrong with me. Maybe there, uh, maybe I just need to find the right woman. And it's just like, nope, <laughs> like she got you, you know? Um, one thing about the grandma. So the, the scene when you were talking about the praying grandma where she was praying, she's praying and she's looking at that picture of him. <laughs> and, like, so the picture has like these giant eyes, right? Cause you, cause you know, they needed to do the effect where the blood comes out. But like, I'm thinking when I'm watching this, I'm like, like who keeps, who keeps a picture like this? It's like, oh, my beloved grandson, and it's just, he's got these giant eyes. <laughs> he's got these giant eyes. <laughs> 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 you know? like, the picture is just so scary. It's like you have this terrifying picture of your grandson in your house. But then, like the next scene, like the blood comes out and you get it. But I was cracking up at that picture because I I remember just in my in my grandma's house, she had this picture of my uncle of my uncle Freeman, like that just, I couldn't, I couldn't be in the house and in, in, in that picture be looking at me. Cause it was just one of those pictures where he's just the face that he's making. It's just kind of terrifying. So I, like if I'd be at her house and she wasn't in the room, I would just, just kind of turn that picture around. A little bit. Yeah. I, 
so just yeah some of the little details like definitely cracked me up the, the scene where um where he confronts her and uh when she comes just has to pick up to pick up the cousin and mm -hmm. um and he's confronting her and then he looks in the mirror and then you don't see a reflection but what you do see in the mirror is a mirror for another trauma field called mirror of death that's hanging up on his wall and the, the reflection of that movie poster is in the mirror and then i looked it up and I, I, I couldn't find it to, to watch it uh, before this, but I looked it up. But th that movie is about this this woman who's like been abused and, and uh, you know, like when, what she sees in the mirror is, is not really what reality is. So it was like, oh, man, like, OK, a little little subtle nod Ooh, to the other, the other films Easter in the egg. library. But yeah, there's uh, there's there's lots of little details that uh, that stood out that uh, that I wouldn't have noticed the first time. No, I think it's uh, there. <laughs> There are there are little just little inklings that are that are not necessarily triggers, but that that spark memory. Like you were talking about the creepy photo in your uncle's house, and like, you know, it brought me back to spending summers at my grandmother's. Uh, you know, either in Atlanta or in LA, and I loved it. But there are always times when you're young, where you know, especially at night, where the house is familiar but also unfamiliar. There are also there are always things about it that are a little bit shadowy, a little bit you're not quite sure. Sometimes. It's, little creepy you don't know what's behind the door but there's a there's an element of like horror within the like the familiar I think and sort of in some ways in which you kind of scare yourself and you know the, again going back to the trope of the praying grandmother where uh I, I like the way he used it here because in so many films she's just kind of like a toss-off character almost almost like a what a su supposedly more uh more um or less less racial uh evolution race uh racist evolution of like the mammy stereotype they just they kind of just turned it into the bit to big mama basically where mm -hmm. she just like never knows what's going on but is always just praying and like she's uh not naive but just kind of like she tends to be oblivious and like not really a knowing character um but in this case she knows exactly what's going on and she really has a really deep spiritual connection with her with her grandson um and like she's very sensitive to what's going on in the spirit world and she shows up right on time which is that's what a real grandmother does um mm -hmm. and she lives she like she's about to get choked out by the succubus and she's just like listen here's what you have to do um and he was taking his sweet time too in that scene that was another thing i was like <laughs> how she said she told you five times that the power is in the word how long does it take you to pick up the bible and in yeah. this um, that's in my notes that this is the slowest dramatic the crawl slowest. for a bible that i've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> they're like you know what to do have you 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 went to you went to church school and uh surely you've seen a movie before can you just like speed this up and hurry but, um, but he also left the bible behind at the beginning he's just like i'm not gonna need you this trip right, right? the bible's like no don't leave no. me in the drawer <laughs> that's <laughs> always the the foreshadowing um, what's the, was there anything in Death by Temptation that you, that made you think of, uh, any other of your sort of favorite sort of indie, indie horror films, any kind of tropes that repeated? Well, of course, well, not so much a trope, but the thing I see in Black films lies where they have the, when the Black person's acting and you don't see the other person, you see their face. And then when the other person's talking, they're, you know, they don't show a wide shot of them two talking. Mm -hmm. It's like, my face. One or the face, other. My face mm -hmm. and your face kind of thing. Um, I like that very much. I also like that, I like Black people reacting to horror because, you know, we use comedy as a way to soothe ourselves. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. When they are terrified, they are still funny. So, yeah, he sees this image and then he goes and tells Dougie, no, nah, bro, I didn't see, you know, her no, she ain't had no reflection. Then they're talking to the sidekick and they're like, you need to, and Dougie's like, yeah, so we're going to have to what? Buy her on holly ground, do all this. <laughs> like he studied, like he read four books and was like, okay. And he's like, excuse me? And then um, he's like, um, no, we got to do all that because I'm not doing all that. And I was like, you know what? Now, because I'm a horror fan, I probably would do all that. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Exactly. Um, but I can understand the regular person going, wait a minute, we got to decapitate them, put them in holy water, holy ground. This it's is too much. much. Like, why we got to do all of this? And I'm like, it's funny, but no, it's not funny because she will kill you. You need to do this. You better put her on that hollow ground like she Dracula. You better get it together. <laughs> is, is that is that Melba Moore uh, making the, 
the cameo as the, the it is kick. and i think yeah. she has a song on the soundtrack yeah uh, she's got the song over the, the closing credits the yeah uh, that's what it is yeah that that scene was was that scene was like scary and funny at the same time because it was just like because the parallels like they're in the they're in the diner talking right like the mm. completely empty diner and this and this 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 couple's on a date and then she's like it's almost like she's channeling the vibe of what's going on yeah and then exactly. she's like oh excuse me i'll be right back let me just go possess this lady right <laughs> you know? like, like i that 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 scene was like it was scary but also funny at the same time it was just like no i'm 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 getting out of here this is too freaky right now but uh, yeah with the one of the ways that they definitely just really played up the scenes is just the lighting. Like there's so many, mm-hmm. there's so many circumstances where just they'll, like there'll be a subtle lighting change or like a spotlight coming from behind somebody or a red light shooting across somebody's face. Where it was just like, just these subtle ways of conveying mood probably in, in some of these circumstances that, you know, shooting on a low budget that probably weren't very easy to do some of these setups. So it's just kind of like, look, like we're going to get creative with the lighting here and just get the, just get the mood across. Um, so yeah, it, it really, it really stands out. Yeah, I think, and Dick, Dickerson, is, he's a lighting genius. And I think you can sort of see both ends of the spectrum of what he's capable of. Here, it's just a, it's a small budget. So he uses, in order to create the, the atmosphere, the appropriate horror atmosphere, he uses a lot of shadows. He doesn't, he, the setting and the, the art direction is really sparse. It's just, a, he just hides a lot and then reveals what he wants you to see use a lot of uh, creative lighting and then you know you see what he can do on a Spike Lee project with a much bigger budget in terms of much more natural light he is a lot you know he involves a lot of crane shots um, and he he creates a sort of a completely different palette um, and I, like you said about the, the sort of two camera angle dialogue that's something you see a lot in Spike Lee's films where it's, he's, he's kind of known for his strategic use of, of close-ups um, and you see a lot in the in Ganja and Hess too where it's there's almost two it's like the kind of style you see how this the styles even the black aesthetic changes so like in the 70s the with the 70s films and we saw this a lot in um, the film Losing Ground which I definitely recommend it's on Criterion um, by Kathleen Collins um, some of the shots that the way they shoot dialogue so you see it in in Ganja and Hess like the dinner scene there's a lot of over the shoulder shots um, and you sort of uh, long shots, a lot more wide shots. They have the 70s kind of quick zoom that you find there too. Um, and then when, when you get the close-ups, they're, they're usually at sort of altered angles um, and they use a lot more natural light. Um, whereas the 90s, there's, you know, you kind of see this new sort of almost like music video style come in with a lot more straight on uh, close-ups. Um, the cuts are faster. The shots, are, the shots take a little less time. And Ernest Dickerson's kind of like a bridge between those two. I feel like where he, he's, he's obviously he's old enough to sort of have learned the trade and and know a lot about the film in the seventies. But he really sort of starts cutting his teeth in the eighties and the nineties. And he he sort of he brings that sort of seventies sensibility into the the new era of of nineties films. And so that's why you have a lot of Spike Lee's films are kind of culturally nineties but have a lot of the sort of craft of like the so-called like American masters of the seventies. So like you, you, you can put them shot for shot up with like Coppola's films and Scorsese's films um, because they all, they all kind of come from the similar school, which I think is, is really cool. And it, it's really cool to see that kind of technique applied to like a trauma film, which is known for a schlock. That's like their whole deal, which is like uh, cheap effects, um, really just cranking out as many films as you can, um, over the top acting, over the top gore. The gore in this film is really subtle. The, the pacing, although it is quick, it's not nearly as quick as most, as most trauma, trauma films. Um, the, what I'm, what's the word? Um, what's the word effects that I'm looking for? You talk about like uh, SFX? Like practical? Uh, practical, thank you. Practical <laughs> effects, they're really, sparingly used and i think they work really well they're just i think they're just enough to to sort of give the whole camp feel but they're not absurd um the gore, the gore at the end when you defeat the succubus again spoiler alert i love the whole, the sort of entrails that they decided to use or it's like this combination of like of like burnt barbecue and also just kind of like goo and stuff um i love the scene 
uh, it's Kadeem Hardison's character gets like gets Cronenberg's into the television. Um, that was I thought that was so cool, and it looked like that's when most of the budget went, honestly. Um, and it, it's there's sort of, uh, and I I couldn't I think the first time I saw it I couldn't figure out what his sin was, um, but I guess maybe it's supposed to be vanity because he's like this idea. Of, he sees himself as an action star in the film and he gets kind of sucked in and gets devoured by him, by his own. Maybe that's his own ego. Um, I don't know. What did you guys think about the TV scene? Cause I, it's one of those iconic scenes of the film that you almost kind of forget about cause so much else is going on. It, it reminded me of a nightmare on Elm street. Um, right. the, the Johnny Depp scene where he gets sucked into his bed, listening to music and yeah, then and back onto the, the bud. Ugh, Yeah. That's such a good like scene. that's, that was, that was what I thought of. Um, but yeah, the but yeah, that is but the the comment the comment about you know his vanity. It's like basically his own image, like sucking him in. It was just kind of like, you know, she was. It seemed like when she was having the interaction with him before, it was almost mm -hmm. like she knew that 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 he was the connection to who she really wanted, Joel. Yeah. But then this one, it's like when she was getting the revenge on them for trying to poison her with the holy water and all that. It's um, you know. She she basically like played them played them through through their own situations, right? It's just kind of like you know this action star who's like see him. it's like he gets keeps getting closer to the TV even though it's himself yes. talking to him, you know, and it's just kind of like come here, right? I think yeah, I think he actually says I think it actually says to him come here and then bites his hand. Yeah, closer. it's so, almost like he's being like the temptation. He's being tempted by himself, which is a total and it it's it's almost like the succubus like one realizes like that's actually his weakness it's not her it's himself and then also uh you know she's kind of like hedging her bets really so she she knows she knows this might be it for her so she's like well let me just plant some seeds so that this can continue um but i think you know for me it it is both of these films are kind of just highlight why we need more not just black directors and like genre films and like one of the things i keep hammering home in this series is like genre films are important one because they have a, a really quick uh they have a built-in language that people understand because there's there's patterns and tropes and so it's it allows you connect to tell stories on a on a larger scale because it's, it's adaptable to different audiences but then also in a practical sense they just make a ton of money like and it's really important for black filmmakers to have access to these genres particularly like horror because they allow you to keep making more films and you know like ernest dickerson i think one of the reasons why the I remember the movie he did tales from the crypt is the demon um demon knight uh i think you know he didn't make that many films which is another pattern for a lot of black directors um just the sheer number of films uh, is just not there. And that's how you build up, you know, that's how you build up your cultural capital. Um, and I think, you know, when you, when you see the directors, black directors who have been able to keep going, a lot of it is because they take, they make, even if they're sort of like make prestige films, they make genre pit stops, you know, like, uh, Spike Lee making Inside Man, like sustained him for a long time. Uh, the, uh, early on he was making music videos, um, Ernest Dickerson doing horror films. I mean, you see it a lot. Uh, I don't know what, so with the, again, sort of like plug the podcast, uh, Girl That's Scary. Uh, I know you guys cover a lot of different <coughs> genres, a different, um, you know, if you had an episode on anthologies too, what have you guys, um, just as being fans and then exploring through the, through the podcast, what have you guys come across uh, in terms of the, um, have you have you been sort of struck by the sort of the the lack of black filmmakers during horror? Have you have been are there certain elements as far as like black representation in horror films that you guys have have uh, kind of run re repeatedly run into over the course of of the podcast? Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, because first of all, if we look at the history, of, like this is something that is in the horror noir documentary. When we get to the thirties, twenties, thirties, forties. You know, first of all, black people are not in the film at all. It's white people playing black people yeah. with black face. And they're like these people who are 
like they portray portray black people as rapists and robbers or all these kind of the other they're the monster you know that kind of thing then you get a little bit closer to where we got that break with night of the living day with Dwayne jones it's like oh they're people wow they can do so they're not a servant and we're still gonna kill them yeah but it opened doors unfortunately with that that Mm -hmm. ending and then you have the 70s where the black exploitation came where oh it's black people although it's still kind of cliche they're cheaply made we're not paying attention too much to character arc just what can make money very quickly and that we can sell but still it's some representation because then like pam greer came up off of that and she was in movies all the way into the 2000s like she was Mm -hmm. in jawbreaker like you know that that helped push them forward so then you get to the 80s where they start putting black people in the white films but they die immediately we're like side characters we're day players mm-hmm. we're filling a, a role we're Voodoo. disposable magical mm-hmm. um yeah definitely that we're playing an array of stuff but we're not really um the lead no we're no always matter. just somebody off on the side someone else who's just another ad somewhere somehow to the story if that mm-hmm. um and now to present day where we're coming across a lot of films. There are a lot of different people who are entering the chat and they are bringing a different perspective where we're once again, like sometimes you sometimes would see us doing these most prominent roles, but now we're really like, okay, not only we prominent roles, we're seeing uh, once again, stories where it's just basically black people. And like we talked about earlier, people thinking, oh, it's not going to sell. No, it's going to sell because I want to see someone who looks like me. I want mm-hmm. that representation. I don't want to think that as soon as I turn the movie on, I'm about to die in five seconds. Like I want to see someone who looks like me, who's able to do a thing or people who look like us who are playing all kinds of stories. Like, if we die in the first five seconds, I'm not about to be mad because it's like five thousand mother of black people in the story. Exactly. Yeah, keep right. going. So you can do that also, I feel like, just not marketing towards black people. Like, our mm-hmm. movies, yes, they represent us, but that representation is for everybody. Because right. how we consume art and how we consume media is subliminal messaging. I don't know if you've seen um, They Live, as John Carpenter, this is like an alien film. Yeah. He put on these little glasses and he could see all the subliminal messaging. And I feel like movies are like that. Yeah. You're showing all these black people who are always like gang members or like stuff like this like that's what people are going to think mm-hmm. and not to be you know I tr- you know like i said god working on me people are stupid <laughs> sorry you <laughs> feed them this they eat it that's what they do they're that's too lazy true. to think and that's not everybody but a lot of people are too lazy to even they're very naive yeah and especially if you're not around black people it's easy to eat up though this is what black people do mm-hmm. i'm gonna just eat this because you don't have anything else to compare it to. And now with Jordan Peele coming out and all these people coming out, like we're going to challenge what you thought yeah. beforehand. And I feel like films like Anjan has challenged it earlier. It just didn't get the praise it needed, right. you know? So now that they're on the forefront, we're putting money into this, like Lovecraft mm-hmm. country. We're putting money into this. All the, with all these white people, all of them are smart. All of them are quick on their feet. None of them are falling when they run. They are succeeding. They're not playing. They're not scared. You know, they're not shucking and jiving and none of this. And they're not taking no crap from um, white people, which I love to see it. Uh-huh. Especially with that film set in the 50s. I would have been scared. Listen, they, they really had the gun. They were like, what you going to do? Which film? Yeah. Uh, I love her country. Country. Oh, right. yeah. I haven't watched it yet. Have y'all? How far? How many episodes have been released so far? Two. Yeah, okay. Tomorrow. Tomorrow's episode. Three. Tomorrow's episode. Okay. So I got time to catch up. It's so it's a Sunday night show. Yeah. Okay, it's really good. good. It's, I it's dude from um, the last black man in San Francisco, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Who's from Dallas? I think actually, there's a there's a piece. Uh, another. Um, there's a recent piece in, in Texas Monthly um, by uh, by a friend of mine who wrote it uh, recently. So I, I need to check that out. But yeah, he's he's really cool. He seems cool. I only saw bits and pieces of, of um, Last Black Man in San Francisco. But I, I think Shirley Smollett is also another, again, kind of underrated. She works a lot, but I still think she's a little bit underrated uh, as an actress. And she was... Uh, couple weeks ago the same week as losing ground we uh for the film series we covered ease by you and she's great mm-hmm. as a child in that and again that has sort of it's a southern gothic tale but there are a lot of elements of you know the same kind of black history historical mm-hmm. um sort of horror trauma involved in there too which i think is is great um and i'm excited i think you know it's, one of the things from what i've read that horror noir covers is it definitely 
hones in on Get Out as a watershed moment um, in, in Black horror. And, you know, even in a watershed moment in that it's, it finally sort of get, makes it fully over the wall. Because like you said, like, I think Ganjan Hess is a watershed moment that kind of got ignored. I think that presentation is um, as another progression of the genre. Um, and it's, it's only two years before Candyman, which I think is a big, it's, I mean, obviously it's an, it's an iconic moment in, in, for black people in cinema, even though it wasn't directed by a black man, but, uh, and you know, the remake coming out, which is all kind of a, a snowball effect from, from Jordan Peele with uh, Nina DaCosta, uh, who I think just got tapped for another show. I can't remember what it's called, um, but there is, an element of it where like you like you know kind of like you mentioned where we you know it's we have our own way of like being scared we, and we have our own way of setting up plot we have our own way of sort of, of we not only as an audience do we have our own way of interacting with horror but like as writers and filmmakers we have our own way of of setting up what is not only what is scary, but what is important. And I think one of the things that they talk about in the, I think the author of the horror noir, the book that the documentary is based on talks about is that uh, horror is um, subjective and contextual. So, you know, what's scary about a certain film for a you know, white audience might not necessarily be the same for a black audience and vice versa. You know, it's like, if you, if you, sw if you're, if you saw Get Out as a white audience, and didn't see certain things as a horrific film. And it's like, you are, you're missing the boat. And a lot of, and you, it's very possible to miss the boat. Or certain films where they're not, certain white films where they're not meant to be scary um, and are actually, would actually be really horrific if you were black in those, in those scenarios. And so there's a, there's a certain, um, I think there, the implications of like perspective when it comes to storytelling are really heightened in, in horror films. Um, and I, I'm excited to see more. I think there's a lot of, um, I was watching, a, there's a short film uh, recently by, let me look up the name real quick because it's something that I'm not good at, uh, at pronouncing. Wow, my internet is going so slow. Her name is, wow, I'm gonna have to look up later, but she just, she did a short film, um, that was featured in the, by the, I think it was um, Tribeza or the Tribeza Film Fest. It's called Suicide by Sunlight. Uh, it's like 15 minutes and she's working on a, another film now. Um, and it's about black vampires. Um, and it's, it's kind of flipping the script where it's because of the extra melan melanin, black vampires are able to be day walkers, whereas white vampires can't. And so there's, it's a short Ooh. film and it focuses on a okay. nurse. Um, I'll, I'll send you all the link, but it's really good. Um, but it's just yeah, another so example um, of, you know, ways in which, you know, sort of storylines that we have access to that are getting left out and ways in which we can kind of reimagine uh, the horror genre that could, there really could just be like an explosion of it, honestly. I think, you know, and it, it, that goes across the board, but I think there's a particular um, implications with horror because if you can kind of reframe what's scary about America to include your experience, then you can kind of reframe your, uh, the way you're contextualized. You can reframe how you're treated and viewed and within the culture. So you can, you can assert a certain amount of agency where it's not just, you know, predominantly white culture dumping all of its evilest elements and projecting them onto you. Now you can kind of uh, take the reins in terms of reframing what that, what that actually means and what's actually horrific about living here. Uh, Gerald, yeah, would you I, say something? Yeah, I, I, I thought you made a, two things came to mind um, <clears throat> when you were talking about, uh, you know, make us, us making films and because we, you know, things that are scared us may, may be interpreted differently by different audiences. There's, there's a, there's a line in, in CB4, uh, the character Dead Mike has, a, uh, as CB4 starts to get more popular, he comes out with a line of black beauty products. And he's like, you know, cause, cause a black man has a different time of funk. And, <laughs> and I, I always love that line. Cause it's, it's true. It's like, we have to make our own stuff. Cause like, 
when you think about Get Out, some people don't get scared in that movie until until you see how sinister the situation is. The first scene in that the movie first is scary scene. because he's walking through a white neighborhood and is just creeped out about walking around. I've been in that situation. Like I, when I moved to to Arizona in high school, and then you're I'm walking around in this neighborhood, and it's just like I don't feel safe out here. And I ran to my friend's house just just <laughs> walking in a neighborhood where I just didn't feel comfortable. You know, and yeah, so it's it that movie hits different, like depending on what your perspective is. So yeah, there were there were tons of scenes in that movie that were um, that were terrifying to me, but other folks were just kind of like, all right, the movie's moving along. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, I, I think that. Like, you know, we, we talked about before when I was on uh, for the uh, for new, for noir uh, uh, for the thrillers, the uh, just watching so many indie films, you know, because it's like yeah, the, the blockbusters are going to be there. But when you really start getting into this and you start digging through, you know, people's, you know, people's deep cuts and whatnot, it's just kind of like knowing that some of these films are out there by black filmmakers when you when you find them later in life it's like man this if i would have seen this when this was new this would have totally changed my perspective back then mm-hmm. and uh and i think that that's that's the best part about this type of stuff to me is like let's let's dig in and and, and watch and maybe someone's gonna stumble onto something that might make them make the next great thing or, or maybe they'll they'll have a point to produce in a in a, in a discussion that like that turns somebody on to some filmmaker who, who deserves more attention so yeah like i um well, this is well, well. Horror is is newer for me in terms of like really starting to dig in a bit more. Um, like, yeah, I I, I want to know like who are the black filmmakers who are who are doing cool stuff. So it's cool to it's cool to revisit some some films, but like I want to know who's who's up and coming. Yeah, as well, like so. who's next? The sorry, the filmmaker's name is Nikiatu Jusu. She's the one who did Suicide by Sunlight, um, and it was not Tribeca. It was uh, Sundance. Um, but yeah, I mean exactly what you were saying, Gerald. I think it's um there's this like i think there's this hunger for for people to not just not only to sort of re um to reinvestigate our history in the genre and other genres but also just to kind of really push out um what's next um and i I think you know i particularly in this moment there's there's no there's so much genre film that can that can be used as a language to describe what we're feeling right now. Um, you know, Jordan Peele talks about how, um, you know, he was the final scene in Get Out. I think for him was it had a direct lineage to the final scene in Night of the Living Dead. Um, and then he actually reworked the final scene because originally he was supposed to end like Night of the Living Dead. And then I think when it came out, there was another police shooting that hit the news, and that's when he kind of decided to to end it in a different way um, and to have him, to have him survive. And so I think those are the kinds of things that are, uh, that are really valuable as, as far as storytelling um, assets. Um, are there any other, any other horror films or black horror films that you guys are see on the horizon or anything, anything that you've seen recently that you really dig or anything that's probably about to come out and you're although I know movie releases are a little bit iffy right now but anything you're excited for yeah I'm excited for Candyman of course because Mm. I I thought that was coming out in June and it's not surprise surprise (laughs) (laughs) I love it very much still um of course like you said Demon Knight that um, tells from a lot of people don't know about the tells from like Demon Knight with Jada Pinkett like they just forget that it kind of exists um I didn't see it I kind of saw it earlier and like shout out jada pinkett who's also in what scream two three who's mm-hmm. like she's she's like a low uh scream queen but go ahead yeah she's definitely a scream queen mm-hmm. um i think sweetheart i think that's on netflix it's like it's a black uh protagonist um i haven't seen it but it's on my list because i'm like i need to see this because i yeah. feel like she's going to make it i hope she makes it Please, Jesus, I hope she makes it. Um, of course, Lovecraft Country is great. Mm-hmm. Um, also, uh, Channel Zero. Yes. Uh, Channel Zero is great. Now, it's not all black, but the f- different seasons, it's kind of like American Horror Story, which each season is completely different and not really tied. Season four centers like a black couple. Yeah. Uh, and, and these I, are based off of creepypastas. Yeah. If you've ever heard of those internet creepy stories, creepypasta. Wait, what is it called? 
The show is called Channel Zero, but okay. it's based off of like, you know, the creepypasta stories that usually exist on the web. Like, oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, kind yeah. of like fan fiction, but they're kind of like get passed on like urban. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait, yeah, so what channel or what network is Channel Zero on? How do you So it was on Sci Fi, but okay. um, it ended and it wasn't renewed. In, mm, but you can stream it on Shudder. Shudder has Oh, all- Shudder has it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And I know before we started uh, chit chatting for real, Gerald had mentioned like vampire things. Um, the Transfiguration came oh, out right. in 2017. Have you guys seen it? Oh, is that that's the one with the black boy? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that movie. I almost yeah. forgot about it. Again, like I said, I will. It's vampire movies are the only part section of the genre that I will watch without hesitation. Transfiguration is really good. I should have I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, yeah, that's a must see. Do you have a show? I, I uh, only, I only started membership to do this episode. <laughs> I hadn't <laughs> had it yet, but now I'm going to keep it for at least a couple months and try to slowly dip my toe. Because again, I think it's such an important genre as anyone who cares about film. So I'm just going to have to suck it up. I think. Uh, yeah. uh, Gerald, what'd you say? Oh no, I, I was asking if the if the Transfiguration was a film or a show, but I, I found it. It's oh, a yeah. film. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, a need to watch it's another sort of and I, what I love about Transfiguration too not only that it centers around this this black boy sort of navigating this single parent also shout out to Aaron Moten who went to my high school who plays the brother in that film hey. he does a great job um, but it's uh, I love the ambiguity of whether or not he actually is a vampire mm-hmm. I think that's such a that's such a key element in terms of just like you know, relating that to like young black male identity and like navigating this and him having to sort of to sort of go to different area, like interact with different people to like get what he wants, the like plan that he comes up with at the end. I, I love that movie. I almost forgot how much I like the movie. I'm Crazy. Gonna... I thought about it as soon as Gerald had mentioned that he was getting into vampire things. I was like, what's this, the name of this movie? Let uh-huh. me look it up real yeah, quick. There you go. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. you told me about that, and that's how I watched it. Yeah, it was a good time. Yeah. I honestly wanted to cry my little eyes out for his life, just in oh general. Oh, my God. I wasn't expecting it to be as emotional as it was for me. Um, but, you know, my eyes are always sweating, so I, I can't really tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fine. I mean, you know, tears come easily for some people, and I think that's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm a total crybaby. Wow. Um, it's like when we watch when I watched Moonlight the first time, it was just like, man, that was good. Watch it the second time. Ah, ah <laughs> I know everything that's about to happen. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> just gushing. Yeah, me. I. Uh, yeah, my um, during this time that I'll be I'll be off work, I'll be putting more time. So I'm working on a, a video game. So um, so it's funny that uh, we watched Up by Temptation because it's uh essentially. The, the game is it's a it's a dating sim but you're but you're playing as you're a vampire who's uh who's using dating apps to you know dabble in romance and then when you get sick of them you bite them so yeah. um so we've been watching a lot of uh we've been watching a lot of vampire stuff just to you know to make sure that we're getting the, the tone right but yeah it's uh there's a lot of a lot of feasting on fuck boys um, <laughs> so we're having we're having a lot of fun I'm, I'm i'm working with a with a with a crew of other women so it's uh it's cool it's uh yeah, I'm having a lot of fun doing it, but um, but yeah, but now that I have some time off, uh, now that I'm done with a lot of this Texas stuff, um, I can just kind of, just kind of kick back and, and make stuff I want to make for a while. That's sick. I love a good vampire video game. Um, are y'all into video games? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think there's, there's a lot of crossover between uh, horror aficionados and video games. And I think video games are another, you know, it's a whole other episode, but in terms of like the filmic quality of games these days too like video game horror is just like a lot of ways you can kind of flesh things out that you can't do in movies just very cool yeah because you have hours of playing movies you got like you got about three hours max okay Mm -hmm. we can't sit like you know that's what's good about shows because you got you get a little bit of the story at a time and they can span it out over you know 10 hours over 10 Mm -hmm. weeks Mm -hmm. video games is kind of at your pace and it's like say it's 50 hours or 60 hours of gameplay and you have to work yourself through the story yeah you know and you're like a part of the story Mm -hmm. you're creating you're not creating you're controlling maybe the protagonist anti-hero depending on what kind of game you have mm-hmm. the main mm-hmm. character you are controlling and making these decisions because i'm a big fan of fallout 
and you yeah. really get to make a choice and the choice could be great or not so great. Um, so your ending depends on the choices you make. Um, also like first person. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, yeah, a lot of choose classic. your own adventure in this one. Um, like it's essentially as you're swiping through faces, you're you're swiping through potential stories you can dig into. So, um, yeah, it, it's I'm 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 really excited about the progress we're making. Um, but yeah, this this started as a as a conversation, and then I just started I started drawing, and then and then just started making screens, and then I was like, hey, I'm I'm gonna need some help writing this. So, um, so I've I've got some folks I'm working with now, and who are We'll keep we'll keep churning along, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely share my progress as as we get to a point where we can kind of, you know, share and beta test yeah. and, and get get good feedback. Because we're, I, I I think it's I think it's cool too because I've I've talked to other other game developers and it's like there's a, there's a hunger for for black developers too. Mm -hmm. I mean, while while I'm a designer and I'm, we're looking for the person to do the coding for us, like just people want indie games made by a diverse audience who are, who are coming with different perspectives. So it's like, I feel like there'll, there'll be people it's like, Oh, this game was made by, by a black dude and a handful of women. Like, yeah, <laughs> like, please, you know? So like, I feel like the, the more progress we make, we'll find, we'll find the support that we're looking for. So mm -hmm. but yeah, Absolutely. It's, but the, yeah, the same thing with the films. It's just kind of like, people are making good work. People just need to see it, you know? Yeah, it is. It's really important just to, I mean, it seems self-explanatory, but like the visibility of films is important. Um, and you'd be surprised how hard it is sometimes to just get it in front of eyes. Uh, and, you know, that's the kind of the jux of it. But yeah, I'm, I'm stoked for that game. Again, I'm like, I'm squeamish about scary video games, but this sounds like right up my alley. Not necessarily too scary, good tongue in cheek. That's, that's, my, that's my vibe. Um, did, uh, I guess we can, that's a good segue into plugs. Uh, Gerald, is there anything else that you, that you have going on? That's the main thing creatively? Yeah, that's, on? yeah, that's the main thing I'm working on now. Um, at, at our movie, movie club, we just finished a, a, a month of music movies, um, which we ended with, uh, uh, the happiness of the categories. But uh, you were, you were there for that one. I was there. That's nice, a wild movie. Nice strange to cut music movie. <laughs> the end of month yeah we're shifting into movies about royals next month so we're going to watch uh uh n any justification you can to watch coming to america for like the millionth time <laughs> uh but yeah uh, we're going to watch royals next month uh, but yeah i'll be i'll be taking a month off uh, essentially uh so i'll get to see family for the first time in a while I'll get to see my significant other for the first time in a while so it'll be it'll be good so i'll just be kind of in creative mode and, and hopefully uh, making a good chunk of progress to, you know, get closer to shipping this thing. That's great. And then people can find you, um, I guess, easily, most easily on Instagram. Um, yeah, Instagram, or if, if you want to talk about movies on Letterboxd. Oh, um, Letterboxd, that's right. Just, yeah, it's just my first name. I, to, I think it's eight characters. I had to sneak in an underscore at the end, but yeah, I'm, I'm just Gerald on there as well. Nice. Um, Sweet. So, uh, Kat and Jazz, what's, what's next for a Girl That's Scary? Wow. Well, um, <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, first of all, we just launched like our Patreon, which is you know, thing for us because I'm like, wow, people, when you make things and people are going to put the money in directly into your pocket. And I was like, all right, whatever. Somebody can give us five bucks, whatever. And then like immediately in the first week, we got like support. And I was like, oh, oh yeah. Like, that's crazy that they care that much to even hear. And it's like, no, okay. That makes you put a little more value behind yourself mm -hmm. to keep going. Um, it's pushing me to grind harder, honestly. Yeah, to, gr to grind it's harder. Exciting. We have so much coming for the next two months. But yeah, look out for some bonus Halloween material because we're doing material on our regular podcast and mm -hmm. Patreon and, you know, extra episodes for holidays mm -hmm. as well. I'm busy. Videos, Trying. Panels. Yeah. Um, <laughs> recorded with other people. Just a lot of things coming up with uh, Girl That's Scary. Um, so yeah, you can follow us on Girl That's Scary literally on everything. Yep. Instagram, Twitter, um, our website is www.girlthatscary. Patreon is Girl That's Scary. Letterbox also Girl That's Scary. Because that's um, I, ju I just found out what Letterbox was like two months ago because I I've been watching movies, but I didn't review them. I just yeah. watch them and we review them on a show, but I never thought that I was a person that <laughs> would know them right. But those are regular people. Yeah. Those 
you see are regular people. And I'm like, you know what? No, I'm going to, because we need, we need some more people who look like us yeah. in here, especially because y'all are not rating movies like the Players Club. Y'all are not rating Eve's Bayou. You're not rating Tales from the Hood, which is crazy because there's all these, okay, already horror is a small niche in itself because everybody doesn't like horror but in that niche it's all white males yeah like you have some white yeah. women fine and i like to have women but the a black voice is like minuscule it's like this so when you go to these big channels no one covered tells from the hood except for like what one or two maybe yeah like no but one covered by you. no one covered but if that. they do they usually cover honestly they cover all the like the like the, the ones that pop out like you remember not like the deep cuts and then like to cut to piggyback on what you're saying like it's mostly white male based like we're of course meeting new people every day which is extremely exciting for us like we connected with you we connect with other people mm -hmm. and i like that because this makes me feel like okay there are other voices um that i can easily find instead of like pages of people that don't look like me and i like meeting new people in general but um I like that when people are being pushed to the forefront. I'm able to see something different. I'm able to see and read and hear about things that are not in a uh, white cisgender male vision kind of scope. Um, I like that we're meeting different queer creators, different black women, men, they people, everybody. Like, I, I love it. And I just like the, honestly, I'm excited to see, not just with us, with you guys, but everybody else, like the future in general. You know, COVID don't take us all out first. Like, <laughs> the future in general of where things are going. Um, because, like, you can see the vision. You can see that, you know, like, in most times, historically, when something is shaky going on, like, that burst of creativity that comes from it. Um, and, I, and in addition to, you know, a global pandemic, like, we also have a lot of unrest. Like, I don't know about y'all, but here, <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm really curious to see how that's going to turn out, too. No, I think you're exactly right. These are exactly kind of moments where creativity just goes through the roof. And we're usually at the forefront of that, I think. But now I think we have a lot of the tools to get our, to get our ideas out. Um, and again, I, I didn't really realize people were on Letterboxd like that until like a couple episodes ago, of this podcast. And I was like, okay. Um, and I, I think, you know, a lot like, coinc like coinciding with what we want as far as like a new a new wave of black filmmakers black uh black artists black actors um black criticism is really important and not necessarily in this like old guard way of like deciding what's good and bad but really just just in the most in the simplest way of like we need people to review our films who understand what we're trying to do who understand the stories we're trying to tell i mean one of the things that i, I like doing throughout this series and just in general is reading old reviews of black films um, where the critics were even more homogenous than they are now. Um, you know, you find old reviews of even Spike Lee's, some of Spike Lee's best films, and you read some reviews and it's like, what is this person watching? And it's just like, and it's just, they're white and they literally don't get it and they don't actually really want to get it. And so there's, it's really important. And I think uh, Haile Jarima, one of the directors in the uh, 70s Rebellion, Spikes talked about it a lot too. They always talk about the importance of, and Spike was one of the first directors uh, who would just start clapping back at, at critics. Um, I remember, I think he, he wrote a, a review, a review of a review for school days. I think it was a, a female, a white critic uh, in the New York Times. And, it was like, and at the end, he was just like, please just don't review any more of my films because you just don't get it. Um, and, it, you know, he got a lot of flack for that. But like, that's important. It's important for people to stand up against the establishment and be like, um, you guys aren't trying hard enough to read our films the way they're supposed to be read. It's important. just a bunch of guys, man. I, I, so I, I, my, my degree is in journalism and I, and I wrote, I wrote film reviews when I was in the college and <clears throat> I'd gotten an internship at this paper and their, their, uh, their film critic was this guy, Bob Finster. Uh, I don't want to slander Bob Finster, but this story stuck out to me because he was, he was notorious for, uh, for writing these reviews of like family films that were super like, you know, like if it was a family wholesome film, great review. If it was, um, you know, something edgy, like he gave, pep, he gave Pulp Fiction a bad review. Like, just like if they were these edgier fare, he would all like, and, but this paper, you know, the Republic was owned by Dan Quayle's family for, for a while. I mean, it might still be, but in any case, um, 
uh, I get this internship. And so like, uh, you know, I'm, you're meeting the staff of the paper and all this stuff. And like, so we start, so we start talking. He's like, well, you know, um, let me look at your clips and then like, let, let's, let's just meet on another day when you're not doing this whole kind of like tour. Cause it was, it was like a bunch of us, right? It's so, like, let's just meet one-on-one. -on -one. So the, the building where, where the, where the Republic is in downtown Phoenix is like, it's, it's at the, the cafeteria in that building is at the, is at the top. And I remember going for this meeting and, you know, we're sitting down to have lunch and he just starts talking about Wes Anderson. And, and, and I, and I do like Wes Anderson quite a bit. And so he's like, you know, I was interviewing Wes Anderson a few months ago and he looks out, um, he looks out the window and he's like, Hey, that's the opening shot of psycho. Right. Cause uh, psycho starts at psycho is my favorite horror movie. And, uh, you know, like it has a swooping shot and you see the Westward Ho Hotel in downtown Phoenix, right? That's the opening shot of the movie. So he's telling me, like, he's like, yeah, I'm interviewing Wes Anderson. This is the first thing he says to me. So he looks out the window and he sees the Westward Ho. And, and he starts telling me about how he had this whole background in experimental film in San Francisco and like all this stuff. So everything that he's saying to me, it just sounds like, man, you've had this awesome life in film. But I'm thinking, it's like, why do you write, why do you write these reviews where you kind of, you kind of diss a lot of the people who are making the type of stuff that, you know, that we want to see that the, the new on the new edgy stuff. And it was like, cause he's got a bills to pay cause he's working for a conservative newspaper and he's just, and he's just writing what he thinks this audience wants to hear. And it's, that's, that's a lot, a lot of folks out there. It's just, it's just a bunch of guys, you know, it's just kind of like, I, I, I remember, not to get on a soapbox, but like, I remember years ago, like um, when I was in design school and, and folks were just kind of like, you know, rather than rip apart designs because they, because they're bad, it's just kind of like wonder what types of constraints those people were working under. And it's just like, when I watch movies, I, I, now I tend not to try to be like, oh, this is terrible. Let me rip it up. It's like, like, let me actually just think about the people who are making this. Let me try to understand mm -hmm. the circumstances that they're working under. And I think that like some, a lot of the times with genre films, it's like, 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 um, like y'all have alluded to, it's like, it's not like, you don't got to compare Death by Temptation to Citizen Kane. It's just like, like compared to other movies that, that are, that are like attacking similar themes and just like point out what it does well. Cause it's like, it's easy to point out what something doesn't do well, like point out what it does well, point out like what, what it's saying that other things aren't saying and you, and you get more out of it. No, I think that's really important. And I think, you know, it's one of the things that we have to, the lens we have to view certain genres in. And also, and it's, it's something that's missing, again, from the way that we evaluate Black films and the way sometimes we evaluate our own films. I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of internalized uh, racism in terms of the way sometimes where we, we view our films through a lens of, of low quality without paying attention to what's actually going up beneath the surface and, and to, the, to the sort of cultural constraints that these films come out of. So I think that's really important. And that's a, I think that's a great place to end, honestly. Um, thanks again, uh, Gerald, for returning as a guest. And uh, yeah, Kat and Jazz, thank you so much. Please check out Girl That's Scary. Hit them up anywhere, all the, all the places for podcasts, website, Patreon. You know, I mean, you know what to do. Just just do it. Just do it. Um, thanks again for coming. Thank you. Um,